We are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret society, opposed to secret oaths, opposed to secret proceedings, secret for secret proceedings. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, could interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to, to, deserve to know. To know. Deserve to know. Welcome to Conspiracy Corner Podcast, everyone. This is Abe, your host. It is January 27th, 2.45 a.m. Um, just got off work. Figured I'd go in on my day off, make a little extra money, because uh, Valentine's Day is coming up. So, me and Sammy, we told what we were doing on a previous episode, uh, so I figured I'd save some money, go ahead and get some money built up for that and rent's coming up soon too so fun fun but uh yeah as far as updates is pretty chill night pretty slow uh honestly i wasn't even gonna go in but i had a co-worker who wanted to come in and he had already come in on one of his days off already so my boss was like oh no you can't do that And I asked my boss, you know, do you need someone to come in? And he said, you can come in if you want. So, but honestly, man, I really wasn't needed. So I wish he would have just said that. But, oh well. I mean, it's time and a half, five hours. So, it's more money. It is what it is. But, uh, let's get on with the show. Today we are covering part two and the final wrap up for the Dead Sea Scrolls. The race is on. The archaeologists explore the cave where the scrolls were discovered, but time is running out. Heading from Jerusalem into the Judean wilderness, a traveler moves from a great glittering city, 3,400 feet above sea level, to a blasted rocky desert on the western shore of the Dead Sea. At at 1360 below sea level, it is the lowest place on earth. The storied spot where, according to scripture, David fled the murderous King Saul and the devil tempted Jesus on the Mount of Temptation. It was also the location of the cave, and on January 28, 1949, roughly two years after the first scroll was unearthed by Bedouins, the archaeologist finally found it, the site that would eventually be called Cave One was about 26 feet long, 13 feet high, and and 3 to 6 feet wide. Since it had already been damaged by Bedouin explorers, the archaeologist had to be particularly careful. Quote, The only tools it was possible to use in the clearance of the cave were pen knives, brushes, tweezers, and fingers, for the fragments are brittle and easily damaged. G. Lancaster Harding wrote, From February 15th to March 5th, Harding and Roland DeVaugh excavated the cave, unearthing documents that were clearly connected to the scrolls that were already known. In particular, the Habakkuk Commentary, the Book of Hymns, and the War of the Children of Light, Harding wrote. They also found two intact jars, pieces, and kinds of jars that that Sukunik had brought Linen fag had bought linen fragments, uh, fragments, phylactery cases, a wooden comb, and one scroll wrapped in linen, stuck inside a jar, that had become a solid black mass. Harding noted. Oddly, the archaeologists didn't consider exploring other caves in the area, a fact they would soon regret. Instead, they set out to explore nearby ruins. 
Kerbet in Arabic of a small town community once known as Qumran. They wanted to know if it was somehow connected to the scrolls. About a mile south of the cave, Kerbet Qumran consists of the remains of two main buildings, a community center in the east and an administrative building in the west. The latter had been built on the site of the previous establishment and was likely settled against the last centuries of the Second Temple period, lasting from 538 BCE to 70 CE. The period was dominated by Rome's conquest of Israel in 63 BCE, and less than 40 years later, King Herod's lavish rebuilding of the modest Second Temple that the exiles had built after their return from Babylon. But who exactly had lived in Qumran? To this day, the question remains a matter of debate, but Deva soon came to the conclusion, still shared by most mainstream scholars, that Qumran had, settled, was, had been settled by the Essenes, a Jewish sect that flourished in Palestine from 150 BCE to 70 CE. Though Judaism likely took many forms at the time, the Essenes were one of the three major Jewish sects identified. By the first century CE historian Flavius Josephus, the other being the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees accepted a literal interpretation of the written law of Moses, or the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, as the basis of their beliefs, whereas the Pharisees embraced the rest, embraced the rest of the books as well as oral instruction. The teachings of a humble carpenter's son who had been crucified in 30 CE would become popular as the basis of the new Jewish sect Christianity. The Essenes were the least numerous of the three, shunning pleasure and rejecting wealth. They believed they were the only Jews who interpreted Holy Scripture correctly and that others had broken the covenant with God. They expected the imminent arrival of a Messiah or Messiahs who along with the angelic host of heaven would usher in an apocalyptic battle. Sinners would be punished and the righteous, in example the Essenes, would forge a new covenant inheriting a new heaven and new earth. In short, the Essenes were exactly the sort of organization whose mores and rituals were reflected in the community rule scroll and whose apocalyptic expectations were reflected in the war scroll in the books of Daniel and Isaiah. But were they the people of the scrolls? The archaeologists were trying to find out when the Bedouins discovered something else, another cave. The Wadi Murabat ravine runs east of Bethlehem past the Herodium, the ancient ruins of King Herod's fortress to the Dead Sea about 11 miles south of Qumran. High up in the rock face of the valley, the Bedouins had found new fragments inscribed with Greek and Hebrew in a cave. Though they claimed that they had discovered them in the first Qumran cave, Deva knew otherwise. The items were clearly different from what they had already been, already been found. When Harding and Deva learned the truth, they turned their attention to the Wadi, or valley, finding what they called large quantities of cloth, basket work, ropes, etc., as well as parchment and papyrus scroll fragments inscribed in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Most of the documents were from the Second Temple period, but the site is not counted among the now-numbered Qumran caves because the materials come from a slightly different period and have a different character, says Shea J.D. Cohen, Lituar, professor of Hebrew literature and philosophy and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. They're not literally or biblical text. They're from family archival documents, marriage contracts, bills of divorce, things like that. The Bedouins would uncover more such sites on the shores of the Dead Sea, but for now, as the archaeologists explored the Wadi, the natives returned to the search to search the Cave One area, 
The Ta Mar Mariah jealously guarded their secrets now, wrote scroll scholar John Allegro, and their cave hunting had become a thoroughgoing business, directed by the leaders of the tribes and engaged in by all the able-bodied members. In February 1952, they found Cave 2. By the time Harding and Duvall arrived at the newly discovered site, it had been plundered by the Bedouins. Only a few documents remained, but it was clear that more scrolls probably existed in the area. So the race was on. The excitement of the search turned aging scientists into a new breed of archaeological mountain goats. Scroll scholar Frank Moore Cross later wrote, But March 10 through 29th, the archaeologists investigated 225 caves along the Dead Sea's western shore. An exploration was made of the holes, caves, and crevices with which the caves are everywhere honeycombed, Duvall wrote. Adding that 26 of the sites explored yielded pottery, which was identical with that of the first cave of Kerbet Qumran. The workers labored under oppressive conditions, to say the least. Many became sick or simply quit because of the unrelenting heat. But the Bedouins, some of whom were helping the scientists, were inde indefatigable. On March 14th, one of them noticed a pot's herd near the opening of a collapsed cave about a third of a mile north of Cave 1. The sun was setting, so it was too late to investigate. But on the following day, the archaeologists broke through the rocks and found Cave 3. They had finally beaten the Ta Amaria. The most intriguing find was hidden in the back of the cave, comprising two sheets of incised copper. The copper scroll listed 64 different locations of buried treasure, possibly hidden before the second temple was destroyed. The piles of gold and silver described in the scroll have never been found. This may be because they never existed, or because the directions are written in an elusive language that only readers of that time and place would have understood. In the salt pit that is under the steps, 41 talents of silver, the scroll reads. In the cave of the old washer's chamber, on the third terrace, 65 ingots of gold. It was an astonishing discovery, and the race was hardly over, and once again the archaeologist had overlooked the obvious. An ancient library? Connections between the ruins of Qumran settlement and the scrolls emerge. One evening in the spring of 1952, as the mystery of the scrolls was emerging, Ata Amariah, elder, told a story to his tribespeople. As a youth, he said, he had chased a partridge into a cave, where he had found pottery, He'd thought nothing of it at the time, but could this be the source of more discoveries? Working under cover of night, the Bedouins finally found the man-made cave number four, a hollowed out in the limestone, Marl Terrace, overlooking the Wadi Qumran, about a mile north of Cave One. It turned out to be the Mother Lode. Though the archaeologists thought their search of the area had been exhaustive, they had clearly missed out. We restricted our search to the rock cliffs and did not examine the marl terrace stretching in, the, in front of them, Roland Duvall wrote. All that we noticed were cavities eroded by water, which were archaeologically barren. It was, it was in this we erred. No kidding. The Bedouin had already removed more than half of the fill of the cave and had worked so carefully that only a few small fragments were found in their debris. A frustrated Duvall wrote, Nevertheless, he and Lancaster Harding discovered an underground chamber missed by the Bedouins, ultimately unearthing the remains of more than 500 scrolls inside Cave 4. They found 575 titles, reflecting the mind-boggling variety of literature in the area. 
There are biblical scrolls, parabiblical scrolls, scrolls that seem to be written about the Bible, but not the Bible as we have it, says Professor Shane Cohen. There are biblical commentaries and paraphrases, calendars, wisdom text, documents about exorcisms and magic and horoscopes, and many documents that are unknown to us. They could be legal or ritualistic in tone or character. During this exploration, the archaeologists discovered the adjacent cave number five, which they excavated in September, revealing the remains of about 25 manuscripts. That same month, the Bedouins found cave number six, containing the fragments of 31 scrolls, just west of Kerbet Qumran. In these caves, the archaeologists unearthed fragments of the so-called Damascus document, which mentions two figures called the Wicked Priest and the Teacher of Righteousness. Do these re refer to historical figures? If so, could they provide clues to the history of the Qumran and its possible connection to the Essenes? It's difficult to determine because we don't know if any of the scrolls were written at the site, if they were brought to the site, or if the Qumran was a sort of library that may have contained scrolls from other groups, Cohen tells. The texts also speak in code, and its writers see themselves in other biblical books, just as the rabbis and Christians would later do. It's called Pesherim, but they're not using names that we recognize. Still, the Damascus document also references an age of wrath, which scholar Giza Vermes, author of The Complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English, identifies as the Hellenistic crisis that began after Alexander the Great's conquest of the Holy Land in 33-2 BCE. The Greek influence of the Jews was reflected in the sensuality and often ribald humor of Ecclesiastes and songs, Song of Songs and led to the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek called the Septuagint in the third century BCE. But many Jews felt the assimilation was corrupt. Around 166 BCE under the Seleucid Syrian Greek King Antioch, Anti Antiochus number four, the influence became pernicious. Jews were forced to endure painful surgery to reverse ritual circumcision, to eat forbidden pork, and to worship the Olympian god Zeus, whose statue was mounted in the second temple. Though many Jews willingly adopted these customs, Marathias Hasmonean a priest who lived outside of Jerusalem rebelled. I and my sons and my brothers will live by the covenant of our fathers, Marathias told officers who had come to enforce Antiochus IV's blasphemous dictates according to the biblical book of 1 Maccabees. Even as Marathias spoke, a Hellenized Jews approached the local altar to offer a sacrifice to a Greek god. He became a sacrifice himself when Marathias killed him and an officer. Let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the government come out with me. Marathias shouted as he and his five sons fled into the hills, eventually followed by other sympathetic Jews. After Marathias' death, his son, Judah Maccabeus, led the rebels in a guerrilla war against the king called the Maccabean Revolt, ultimately triumphing over Antiochus IV and the Seleucids. Behold, our enemies are crushed, Judah said. Let us go up to cleanse the sanctuary and dedicate it. During the ritual cleansing of the second temple, or so the apocryphal, apocryphal legend goes, Judah and his followers found only enough oil to keep the menorah burning for a single day, but the fuel supposedly lasted for eight days, a story that of course became the source of Hanukkah. The Hasmonean dynasty, the term comes from 
Marathia's clan name, that followed their rebellion was ruled by Jewish kings and high priests. But the anti-Hellenistic warriors soon slipped into, of all things, Hellenism. Jonathan, Marathias' son and Judah's lieutenant, became high priest in 153 BCE, but he was corrupted by power, and when his brother Simon took over, he aligned himself with the Romans. Jonathan was, many scholars believe, the wicked priest who may have caused the Essenes to flee Jerusalem. We don't know for sure why the anti-Hasmonians left for the desert, says Cohen, but the usual view is that they began as a group of Jerusalemite priests who were dis disenchanted by the Hasmonians because they were too Hellenistic, too militaristic, and sufficiently pious, so they retreated to Qumran, where they gradually morphed into a group of aesthetic priests. But here's the tricky part, he continues. Is there a way to tie the history of the Qumran settlement to the history from the scrolls? The limestone cliffs of the Dead Sea, Dead sea had not revealed all, the de all of their secrets, but no further caves were discovered until early 1955, when the Bedouins, of course, found numbers 7 through number 10 in the Marl Terrace. These proved to be relatively insignificant sites, revealing nothing but a few fragments. Even so, the archaeologists and others were forced to buy the documents from the natives at considerable cost, just as they had done throughout the excavations. Eventually, most of the items ended up in Israel's hands, but the four original St. Mark scrolls were, bought, were brought to the United States in 1949 by Metropolitan Samuel, who was seeking to raise funds for his church. They were exhibited at the Library of Congress and elsewhere, but no buyers came forward. Then on June 1st, 1954, an advertisement appeared in the Wall Street Journal. Biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. When Sukhanik's son, Yigal Yadin, an archaeologist and former chief of the general staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, found out about the offer, he sent Professor Harry Orlinsky of the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, to buy them for the sum, low even then, of $250,000. Not for the first time the scroll saga took on an element of skullduggery, because Samuel may not have wanted to sell the scrolls to Israel. Orlinsky was instructed to call himself Mr. Green and to take a taxi to Lexington Avenue entrance of the Wardolf, uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where the Chemical Bank and Trust Company had a branch. Orlinsky later said, I was to make sure that I was not followed. Mr. Sidney M. Estridge would be waiting there for me. We had been told how to identify one another. He would go with me downstairs to the vault of the bank. There we would find Samuel, with the scrolls ready for examination. I was to say as little as possible and admit to no identification beyond being Mr. Green. Soon after, it was noticed that a piece of the Habakkuk commentary was missing from the scrolls. Samuel found it lying among his things and simply put it in the mail. In 1956, battle for possession and control of the Suez Canal, a man-made Egyptian waterway connecting the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, renewed tensions in the Middle East, leading to the dis dismissal of Harding, a Brit, from his post in Jordan and to the invasion of Egypt by Israel, Britain, and France at the end of the year. The crisis interrupted the restoration and translation of the scrolls that had begun a few years earlier when Deva, an alleged anti-Semite, hired a team of eight scholars, none of them Jewish, to work on the documents. It also put a halt to the investigation of cave number four trove and interfered 
interfered with the excavation of the last known Qumran cave, cave number 11, which the Bedouins had found in February 1956. Cave number 11 ultimately proved productive, however, yielding 31 texts including a copy of Leviticus, a copy of the Book of Psalms containing material not found in the Bible, and the Temple Scroll, the longest scroll known to exist, which soon vanished. Israeli authorities recovered it following the 1967 Six-Day War in a shoebox hidden under the floor of the antiquities dealer Kando's home. The Temple Scroll was especially significant, written before Herod's reconstruction of the Second Temple. The apocalyptic document offers instructions for the building of an even more spectacular structure, one designed for the truly righteous people, read the Essenes after the apocalypse wipes out all of the sinners. Needless to say, it was never built. When the Messiahs, along with the host of heaven, did not arrive, the faith of men of Qumran was sorely tested, Trevor wrote. Indeed, all their prayers and relentless self-denial came to naught after the Jewish revolt against Rome in 66 CE. Fed up with extreme taxation and ongoing oppression, Jewish rebels destroyed a Roman garrison and later massacred 6,000 Romans during the Battle of Beth Horon. Of course, Rome took revenge and Qumran was likely destroyed in 68 CE by Roman general Vespasian's troops during the siege of the Holy Land. We don't know for sure that the Romans destroyed Qumran, but they were cleaning up the countryside around Judea at this time. So it's tempting to assume this, says Cohen. We do know the community ended in 68 CE because that was the date of the last coins found at the site. But what had happened to the Essenes? Though some scrolls show signs of violence, the only human skeletons found at Qumran were in a cemetery, leading some scholars to believe that the people escaped perhaps across the Jordan River to a group of cities called Decapolis, perhaps to the mountain fortress of Masada, 30 miles south, or perhaps to join the revolt against Rome. One fact is certain, Giza Vermes wrote, no one of the original occupants of Qumran returned to the caves to reclaim their valuable manuscripts. The same year Qumran was destroyed, the Emperor Nero died followed by a Roman civil war in the year of the four emperors. The unrest delayed further Roman attacks on Judea. But those attacks resumed in earnest when Vasparian became emperor in 69 CE, eager to establish his authority. Vasparian and his sons Titus led their legions to Jerusalem, laying waste to the city and destroying the second temple. They made the whole city run down with blood, wrote Flavius Josephus, an eyewitness, to such a degree indeed that the fire of many of the houses was quenched with these men's blood. The end of the world had indeed arrived, just not in the way that the Essenes had expected. The Messiah had not ushered in the world to come, and the sons of light had finally lost. They were certainly depressed, pro providing ideal candidates for preachers of the Christian gospel, Trevor wrote. At least some Essenes, it's not reasonable to assume, became Christians. Though Jesus Christ had died 40 years earlier, his influence was just beginning, probably written around the same time as the destruction of Qumran in the siege of Jerusalem, the first Christian gospel, Mark was based in part on Isaiah's ancient message to the Jews of the Babylonian captivity. Even as this is written, Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I sent my messenger before the face, who shall prepare thy way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ye ready the way of the Lord. And now we return to the beginning of our story, though the scrolls reflect a history of suffering and a legacy of lost. I cannot avoid the feeling that there's something symbolic in the discovery of the scrolls 
and their acquisition at the moment of the creation of the state of Israel, wrote Yadin. It is as if these manuscripts have been waiting in the caves for 2,000 years, ever since the destruction of Israel's independence. Until the people of Israel had returned to their home and regained their freedom, this symbolism is heightened by the fact that they were the first three scrolls were, were bought by my father for Israel on 29th, November 1947, the very day on which the United Nations voted for the recreation of the Jewish state in Israel after 2,000 years. But there you have it, folks. We're going to wrap it up there. That is the story of the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I hope you all enjoyed. And please like, share, and subscribe. You can find us on YouTube. It's Conspiracy Corner Podcast. The profile picture is a bunny rabbit holding a samurai sword. And you can also find us in audio format only. Um... In Breaker, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, Spotify, and of course Anchor. Thank you for tuning in. Please like, share, and subscribe, and you all have an awesome day. We are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret society, opposed to secret oaths. Opposed to secret proceedings. Secret for secret proceedings. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, could interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes. Or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know.